Okay, okay. We're going to get to the podcast in just one minute. But imagine I gave you the opportunity to invest in Microsoft, in Apple, in Tesla at its infancy. And now you made all this profit and it would be unbelievable. You'd be so thankful and so grateful. I believe that that day is today for Torch. Because for the next 36 hours, every donation you contribute at givetorch.net is doubled by our generous matchers, and you can come in at the ground floor. Yes, last year, over 1 million people enjoyed our podcasts. You as well, I hope. And I believe we can get to 10 million this year, but we need your help. It's only one day a year that we ask. We need your contribution. We need your partnership. We love your partnership and your friendship. Please contribute at givetorch.net, givetorch.net. Every dollar is matched. I apologize for taking your time. Thank you so much in advance for your support. Enjoy this episode. You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Thinking Talmudist. Today, we are going to continue in the same Gemara that we started several weeks ago. But it's going to be a totally different topic. If you remember, we mentioned that Hashem has a moment of anger where he gets angry and that moment is fleeting. So the Talmud now is going to say, well, you mentioned that previously. Let's elaborate a little bit more on that. And this is the Talmud in Avodazara 4a, Tractate Avodazara 4a, on the bottom of the page. So the Gemara continues with a b'risa that speaks of God's anger. Tana Rabbanon, the rabbis taught in a b'risa, El zoim b'chol yom, God is angered every day. Vekamazamo, and how long does the anger last for? Rega, just a moment. Vekamo rega, and how long is this moment, this said moment? Achas mechomesh ribo vishloshes alofim vishmona meos vearboim mushmona bisha. One fifty three thousand. 848th part of an hour. So it's like a millisecond. Zoe Rega, that's a moment. Ve'en kol beria yocho lechaven oso rega, and no creature could precisely compute when this moment occurs. Chutz mi bilam harasha, except for Bilam, the wicked prophet who was hired by King Balak to curse the Jews. You remember that? You remember that story in the book of Numbers that we spoke about just recently in our complete Bible crash course on Tuesday nights on the book of Numbers, where we have the story of Bilaam, who was the most powerful prophet, more powerful, our sages tell us, than Moses. Now, he used his powers in the wrong way, but he had the capability of being even greater than Moses. And our sages tell us because the nations of the world are going to ask and say, if we would have had a prophet like Moses, then we would have chosen the Torah. Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to give you a better, a bigger. I'm going to give you a greater prophet than Moses was, someone with the abilities that are far superior to Moses. And let's see what he does with it. And sure enough, it has nothing to do with your capabilities. It has to do with your power of will. And if you will to do something, and this is the same thing we know with athletes. It's the same thing we know, we know with every other area of life. It doesn't have anything to do with how much talent you have. It has much more to do with how much will you have. And here, this prophet had a will to do evil, wicked things with his power. And therefore, he wasn't as great as Moses. So the Gemara now says, the Gemara adduces a source for the last statement. The for it is written regarding Bilam that he was, now we're on the top of page 44, B on, on top, Viodea das Elyon, as the verse tells us in Numbers, that he knew the mind of the Supreme One. Bilaam was so powerful a prophet, he was able to understand the exact moment, that sliver of time where God is angered, 
And that's when he wanted to curse the Jewish people and just capitalize on that moment of anger and then whatever he asks for, he'll get. So now the Gemara asks, Efshar das behemto lo haviyada? Das elyon mi haviyada? Is it conceivable that Bilam, who did not understand his animal's mind, that he's able to understand God's mind? Remember what happened with Bilam. Bilam was walking with his donkey, or riding on his donkey, and the donkey smashes, the donkey stops, and he hits the donkey, and the donkey moves to the side, stops again. Remember the story, right? And he hits the donkey again, and then he, the donkey smashes his leg against the wall, Bilam's leg. And then he starts yelling at the donkey. The donkey responds and speaks to him. So the Talmud here is saying, one second, you're telling me this brilliant Bilam understands God and can can capitalize on that moment of God's anger, but he's not good enough to understand the donkey? Give me a break. It's a great question, right? How can you say that he's so powerful that he can understand the donkey, but he cannot understand, that he can understand God, but he cannot understand the donkeys? The Gemara explains, My das What does it mean when it says that he did not know what was on the mind of his animal? When the Moabat emissaries saw that Bilam was riding on a donkey, Amrule, they said to him, my time lawyer hafta suse asusia why did you not ride a horse amar lahu he said to them biritiva shidai le usually i ride a horse however today i am riding a donkey for the first time because i put my horses in the marshland to graze miyad vatomer ha son halo anochi son kha immediately in response to this comment Scripture reports that the donkey said to Bilam, Am I not your donkey? Amarle, Bilam answered the donkey, Leti'ina ba'alma, I use you only for carrying burdens, for carrying things. Amarle, but the donkey responded to Bilam saying, Asher achaftalai, that you have ridden on me? contradicting Bilam's contention that she was merely a beast of burden, you ride on me all the time. What are you talking about? Omar Le, Bilam said back to the donkey, I cry Baalma, only occasionally do I ride you. Ordinarily, I would not do so. Omar Le, the donkey responds back to him, your entire life till this very day, you used me as your transport. What are you talking about? And he's contradicting Bill's contention that he had never written the donkey except on rare occasions. Velo od, and not only that, the donkey continues and says, Elo shani osel lecha rechivos bayom. And I furnish you with riding by day, v'ishus balaylo, and marital acts at night. I'm... Okay, he's accusing Bilam. What are you talking about? By day you ride me as a as an occupant, and at night you use me for marital relations. Ksiv hocha hahaskein hiskanti. This is deduced as follows from what is written that the donkey said, "Have I been accustomed?" Hahaskein. Hiskanti to do such a thing to you, Let her be for him a warmer sochenes. To this retort of the donkey, Bilam was unable to make any reply. Thus, the donkey bested Bilam in their verbal sparring, in their disagreement. How then could Bilam claim? to know the mind, right? Such a lowly Bilam, how can he understand the mind of Hashem, the Supreme One? 
That is, to know and manipulate the mind of God to allow him to curse the Jews when it is evident that he was unable to know and manipulate even the mind of an animal. Good question. Elamai v'yodea das elyon. Rather, what it means here is that Bilam's description of himself as one who knows the mind of the Supreme One, what does that mean? Shehoya yodea lechavin osa shosh ha-kodesh baruchu ko-ispo. He wasn't, didn't understand how God operates. He just was able to trigger that moment, that little millisecond of God's anger. And he was able to u- utilize that moment to curse the Jewish people. So if Bilam cursed someone at that precise moment, the curse would be effective. And this is what's the, what's the meaning of the prophet Micah when he says about says to Israel, My people, remember please what Balak, king of Moab, plotted Uma ana oso bilam ben bar, ben beor. What bilam, the son of beor, answered to him, minashitim viad hagilgal. Remember the period from the shitim to the gilgal, leman das tzitkos Hashem, and that you may realize the benevolences of Hashem. The Gemara now shows. How this verse is consistent with the interpretation of the phrase, one who knows the mind of the Supreme One. Okay, so what what, what, what happened here? Bilaam had one ability. He wasn't able to understand animal speak, and he definitely was not all able to understand the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Definitely not. What was he able to do? He was able to manipulate the moment of anger of God. And if he would curse someone at that moment, the curse would go into effect. Now, if we take a zoom out of this whole story, let's just be reminded that all of this was not known to Moses. All of this happened without Moses even knowing that it was happening. Moses is writing from the dictation of Hashem. Hashem is saying, Bereshis, Baruch Elohim, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and Moses is writing, as God dictates, every single thing. Then what happens? And everything is exactly how Moses remembers it. He remembers, yeah, this is what happened with the burning bush, and this is what happened with the exodus of Egypt, with each one of the plagues, and this is what happened at Mount Sinai, and this is what happened with the children of Aaron, that they brought the offering that was undesired by Hashem and their lives were taken. Everything was exactly how Moshe remembered it. Accurate, perfect. And everything happened exactly the way the Jewish people remembered it. In perfect accuracy. Comes the story of Bilam and Balak and Moshe has no idea what God's talking about. Because he had no idea that this happened. This happened from afar. right? The Jewish people are there in the desert. They go up on a cliff, Bilam and Balak, and they overlook the Jewish people. And Balak says, curse these Jews. Bilam says, I can't. I can't do it without God's approval. This whole story, and Moshe says, well, what's going on here? How can this happen? That there's an entire narrative that I knew nothing about. And why would we dedicate an entire portion of the Torah to the name of Balak, this wicked king, to remind us a very, very, very crucial part of God's way of running the world. And that is, God protects you without you knowing. How many times were you delayed from a certain situation that could have been catastrophic for you. You never even know. You got upset. Why was I late? I missed the meeting. Could have been the worst meeting of your life. I wanted to share with you an incredible story. I know the person this happened to. 
I verified the story. A man who lived in Jerusalem was visiting Boston. And on September 11th, 2001, had a flight to go from Boston to Los Angeles. And that morning, he gets on the plane. And he realizes as they're about to close the door of the plane, he realizes that he forgot his tefillin, his phylacteries, in the terminal. And he goes to the stewardess and says, I need to get my tefillin. She says, we're about to close the flight. If you get off the plane, you're not getting back on. At first, they didn't want to let him off. And he's, he says, I, I'm, I'm just, I'll jump off the plane. I don't care. I need to get my tefillin. I need to get my tefillin. And it was a whole thing back and forth. And finally, they said, we're not going to let you get on this plane again. The plane's going to leave. You're going to miss the flight. And this is uh, this whole 45-minute delay. Finally, he says, I don't care. I'm going off the plane. I need to get my tefillin. Tefillin is a very, very precious, powerful mitzvah. It's the mitzvah where we put and tie onto our arms opposite our heart and our, on, our, on our head opposite our mind that our actions and our thoughts are going to be committed to God. It's a daily mitzvah every single day aside for Shabbos and Yom Tov. We put these tefillin on. And I, I know my tefillin. I, I don't let them be within five feet from me. If it's not in my house, it's with. I never ever send my tefillin under the plane. I was once going on a flight, and they said, it, you know, they changed planes. It was a smaller plane. It was like one of those uh, American Eagle planes. You know, those, those American Airlines, the Eagle. So it's like really, it's like you know, one seat on each side of the plane. It's like it was really, really. They said, sorry, we have no room for hand luggage. It's gonna have to go under the plane. I said, that's fine. I opened up my bag, take out my tefillin. My tefillin comes with me. Why? Who knows if I'm going to ever see that hand luggage again? And I've heard dozens and dozens of stories of people who left their tefillin inside the luggage that went under, and that bag got lost. To me, my tefillin are so precious. Since I'm 13 years old, wearing those tefillin every single day, I, I don't let them out of my... So here this rabbi says, I'm getting off this plane. I need to get my tefillin. So they finally let him off the plane and he misses the flight. And that is one of the, that was the second plane that went into the World Trade Center. And this wasn't only a miracle for him. This miracle saved thousands of lives. Thousands of lives. Because everyone will tell you that if both planes hit at the same time, nobody would have had a chance of evacuating in a timely fashion. But because there was a 45-minute delay between plane one hitting and plane two hitting, thousands of lives were saved from the second tower, from the first tower. They say that if both of them would have hit at a similar time, not 45 minutes apart, the impact would have knocked them both down much quicker. We don't understand how things work. We don't understand why God needed this to happen to begin with. What was the lesson for us, for the world? God doesn't do things randomly. There's a reason for it. We don't need to always understand the reason for it. I want to just share with you something so beautiful that I heard recently. I have to share this. We talk a lot about seeing the full picture. You have to see the full picture, but we don't. We're limited. We're limited in our perspective. We come in, we were born 1980. Hopefully we live till 23, year 2300, 120 years later. We return our soul back to the Almighty. Okay. But that's it. We have a sliver of history. What happens to the 
thousands of years prior. What happens to, you know, the years beyond our life? Don't know. All we get to see is our little perspective on the world. But sometimes we make judgment without seeing a full story. Even, by the way, challenging things like the Holocaust. Oh, where was God? Where was God in Auschwitz and in Birkenau when they were burning people alive? When they were gassing people? When they were shooting people? Where was God? We don't understand the story. We don't understand the full picture. We're going to have to zoom out a lot to see the full picture. But I want to share with you a verse that we recite three times a day in our prayers. A verse from Psalms 145 in the Ashrei. So the verse says as follows. Show mer Hashem es kol ohavav es kol harishoyim yashmid. Hashem protects all who love him and all the wicked he will destroy. Again, Hashem protects all who love him and all the wicked he will destroy. So verse. So the way you properly read this verse is with two parts. There's two halves of this verse. Hashem will protect all who love him, comma, and all the wicked he will destroy. But what's if I don't read the whole thing properly? Let's say I read it the following. Hashem protects all who love him and all the wicked. Let me read it a different way, incorrectly. Those who love him and all the wicked, he will destroy. Does that make sense? That doesn't either make sense. Again, Hashem will protect those who love him and the wicked. Those who love him and the wicked, he will destroy. Do you understand the problem here? If you leave out part of the verse, it doesn't make any sense. Why would Hashem protect those who love him and the wicked? And why would Hashem destroy those who love him and the wicked? No, you're not reading it properly. You got to read the whole verse. You got to see the full picture. When you see the full picture, zoom out. Hashem protects all who love him and the wicked he will destroy. Now it makes sense. You see, sometimes you you zoom in too much and you don't see the full verse. You don't see the full picture. You just see part of it. Like, that doesn't make any sense. What type of cruel God destroys the wicked and the righteous together? doesn't make any sense. That's right. That's why our sages tell us this is part of our prayer. You have to see the full story. It's very, very, very rare that we get a glimpse at the full story. Usually, we only get a little perspective, a little glimpse into how Hashem operates. Bilam, the story of Bilam and the story of Balak, Moshe had no idea that it even existed until he's writing the Torah. As Hashem dictates it, he says, Hashem, I don't know if he actually said these words, but Hashem, when did this happen? I never knew this happened. And Hashem could respond, oh, this happens to you every day and I protect you. You think the nations of the world don't scheme against the Jewish people every day? You think that behind closed doors they're not planning another October 7th attack, another Simchas Torah attack? But Hashem protects us. And Hashem watches over us. And sometimes Hashem allows things to happen so that we can wake up and that we can be guided on a path of proper conduct. And you see, it's an amazing thing. It was a tragic, tragic event that happened on Simchas To over 1,200 people murdered, raped, burnt, 
men, women, children, seniors, Holocaust survivors. I mean, it's just like, it's unfathomable. Over 200 hostages. We still have 136 hostages in Gaza. It doesn't make any sense to us. But look at how this changed our people. Look how people are waking up across the globe. People are waking up and saying, you know what, I need to invest in my Judaism. People are turning around and saying, it's time to start keeping Shabbos. There are programs like, keep Shabbos for a soldier. The soldiers are out in the battlefield, they can't observe Shabbos. I'll do it for them. And people are undertaking the observance of Shabbos in the merit of the soldiers. And people are taking on more and more mitzvahs who ordinarily would not have. There's a complete transformation of our people. Do we know if that's the reason God brought about such a devastating tragedy upon his people? Possibly. We don't know, but we can look back at history. If you remember, I shared this before, actually, In these week's Torah portions, we have the conversation between Moshe and Hashem. Where Moshe says, Hashem, I want to see your face. Hashem says, no, you can only see the back of my head. It says that God shows him the, the strap of his tefillin. No, come on, give me a break. God doesn't have a front of his face. God doesn't have the back of his face. What type of head does God have that Moshe is saying, I want to see your face? God says, no, you can't see the front of my face. You can only see the back of my face. I say, just say, that what Moshe was asking was to try to understand how this world operates. That's the future. I want to understand your future. God, how does this play out? How does this make any sense? God says, no, no, no. The face, meaning the future, you'll never be able to see. But if you look back, meaning the back of my head, you look at the back, the history, you look back at history and you'll see that it always worked out right. How many times, Kai, how many times did you have in your life, you're like, you're, you're in this, in this jam of like, how is this going to play out? Like this doesn't, okay, we're just locked. And only to find that it's the best solution comes out of it. You get fired from your job and you're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to pay rent this month? And only to get a much better job with better conditions, with better employment, with a better benefit package, with better circumstances. And you were worried, how is this going to work out? It doesn't make any sense to me. Look back at your history. Look backward and you'll see that it always worked out. And it wasn't good, it was great for you. I can tell you dozens and dozens of stories of things that happened to students of ours of here, here in Torch. Where they tell me, it's the worst thing in the world, I don't know what's going to be, only to find that it's opened up new doors. Hashem shut a door so that He can open a new one. But we don't see that, because we don't see a full picture. We don't understand what the future is holds for us. So we're worried. But there's a verse that we recite every morning in Adon Olam, which is, Hashem li below ira. When I know that Hashem is with me, I have nothing to fear. You want to know the antidote? Do you want to know the response to all anxiety? Hashem li. Hashem is there for me. And therefore, I have nothing to fear. It's like a child. A child is afraid of something, anything, till they're in the arms of their parents. And in the arms of their parents, they know my parents are going to protect me. But how are they going to protect me? doesn't make a difference. I know I'm in my parents' arms. They always take care of me. They always took care of me. They'll continue to take care of me. When I feel their embrace, I know that everything will be fine. Hashem is that parent. And that when we know that we're in Hashem's arms, and Hashem gives us a loving embrace, we have nothing to worry about. 
no anxiety, no panic, no worry, no fear. Because Hashem is my Father in Heaven. He's going to take care of me. He always has. And He always will. This is something that we can learn from the whole story of Bilam and Balak. When Moses didn't even know that it existed, Hashem gives him a little window into the world of God. Where God protects the Jewish people without them even knowing there was a threat on their neck. Bilam was able to identify the exact moment of God's anger and slip in a curse against the Jewish people and boom, it would go into effect. God protected the Jewish people. And God gives us that glimpse so that we know Hashem is always there to protect us. When we see it, and even more so when we don't see it. When we don't know that it was even there, that it was even a possibility, Hashem was there to protect us. We continue. The Talmud now says, so now the Gemara is going to show how this is consistent with the verse. Omar, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lazar says, Omar lehen HaKadosh Baruch Yisrael, the Holy One, blessed is He, said to Israel, Ami, my nation, Ru'u kamat sedakos asisi imachem, observe how many acts of kindness, how many benevolences I performed for you. Shalom ka'asti aleichem kol osan ayamim. That I did not become angry in all of those days of Bilam when he was seeking to curse you. So what did Hashem do? Hashem said to protect the Jewish people and so that Bilam cannot intervene and slip in his curse against the Jewish people. God did not become angry during those days. Sheim ka'asti aleichem, because had I become angry with you, lo nishtayim me'ovde kochavim nison em shal Yisrael srid v'falit. No remnant whatsoever would have remained from the idolaters and from the enemies of Israel. V'hainu de ka'ama lei bilam lebalak. And this is the meaning of that which Bilam told Balak, the king. Ma ekov lo kabo el, u ma ezom lo zoam Hashem. How can I curse? God is not cursed. How can I anger? Hashem has not become angry. This teaches that throughout all those days, Hashem did not become angry to protect His people. Hashem changed the ordinary activities of the world. So now you can ask a question. What's God doing with being angry? Don't we know that anger is a, a negative trait? God, God doesn't. Really, God is perfect. God is perfect in all traits. You're thinking about that question, right? What is, what is this business, God getting angry? We talk on our podcast every week. We talk in the Jewish Inspiration Podcast about good character traits, about acting in a kind way, acting in a patient and loving way, acting in the proper with the proper conduct, proper midos. What type of thing is this? Hashem gets angry. Hashem is all perfect. Hashem is all kind. Hashem is all forgiving, all compassion. Hashem gets angry? So we have to understand something. This is something so fundamental for us to understand. Every trait has a positive and a negative. Every trait has a positive and a negative. Is it appropriate for a parent to act in a way of anger to their child? Well, it depends. It depends. I'll tell you a story. There was someone who, you know, the great rabbis, and my grandfather would have a, 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 a visiting hours where people can come and ask questions. Grandfather was a big rabbi. And every evening at 9 o'clock, or sometimes even a little earlier, his home was open. People would come wait outside the door, and there'd be lines out the building, people waiting to just have a few minutes to ask their question. 
And one after another, people would come in, ask their question. My grandfather would inquire more details and give them an answer. That's what happens when you're wise. That's what happens when you're, when you're righteous. People come and seek your advice. So, this wasn't only my grandfather's. Many, you have, today you have many, many holy people, and this people come and wait hours and hours to ask them a question. We see this with Moses, by the way. This is what Yisro was giving him advice, telling him, you can't handle all the questions on your own. You gotta delegate and have the first pyramid scheme where Moses was on top and he had people who were answering the questions for the thousands, questions for the hundreds, questions for the tens, for the individuals. And he assigned different leaders of tribes so that not all million questions got to Moses. The lower ranking prophets were able to answer those questions. So Reb Moshe Feinstein was one of the great, great halachic decisors of the last century. And people would come from far and wide to ask him questions. And one time, someone was waiting outside and he hears that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is yelling at the person inside. And one thing that was known to everyone about Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, he was the kindest, sweetest, gentlest person. And for him to be yelling in such a way was just out of character. So, when the person left the room, the person who heard these yells walks into Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's office and sees that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is so calm, so cool, usually it takes some time to, to work down that anger. So he asks Rabbi Moshe, weren't you just angry, yelling at this person? He says, yelling, yes. Angry? He said, the person needed to hear something that was forceful. He needed to hear something which was strong. So I needed to give him a, a show as if I was angry. But need to get angry to lose my composure? Heaven forbid. Uh, just to give you an understanding of how the patience of Rabbi Feinstein Rabbi Feinstein was known as a very, very humble person. One time, right before Shabbos, I've shared the story a hundred times, but it's so beautiful. I love this. It's one of my favorite stories. And I'll repeat it. I don't know if we've ever said it on the Thinking Talmudist podcast. So one of the rabbi's students was attending in his home, taking, you know, picking up the phones, as, you know, it was, it was uh, early on Friday, and they get a phone call at the rabbi's house, and the student picks up the phone, and it was an elderly lady on the other end of the phone, and she says, hi, is Rabbi Feinstein there? And to which the student says, no, he's not available right now, can I, can I help you? So she says, I just wanted to know what time candle lighting is this Shabbos. <laughs> so the student says, you know, pulls out his torch calendar and says, the only candle lighting is at whatever time it was. And then he adds, he says, you know, you don't need to call Rabbi Feinstein for such a question. Rabbi Feinstein is a very busy man. You, know, you can just look at any Jewish calendar and see what time candle lighting is. You don't have to ask Rabbi Feinstein. And the lady responded, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've been calling Rabbi Feinstein for the past 25 years. He never said anything about calendars. Imagine, every week, this woman would call Rabbi Feinstein and ask him, what time is candlelighting? And with all the love, with all the humility, with all of the compassion, he gave her the exact time and wished her good Shabbos like she was the only person on planet Earth. And she probably had no idea who Rabbi Feinstein was. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. She opened up the yellow pages, Rabbi. Oh, there's a rabbi. She called the rabbi in the, in the yellow pages. And she calls him every week. What time is candle lighting? And that's it. What does she know about who Rabbi Feinstein is? But that's what greatness is. And now you're telling me that God gets angry? God gets angry? 
So we need to understand that every trait could be used in a, in a good way and in a negative way. I'll give you an example. Kindness. We all know kindness is a great trait. Great trait, right? Any, anything negative about kindness? No. Kindness? Whatever you need. You need a jacket, I'll get you a jacket. You need a drink, I'll give you a drink. Whatever you need, that's kindness. But is there a negative kindness? There could be a negative kindness. Someone who's so kind that doesn't take care of their own family, they give everything just to other people. That's great that you're kind with everyone, but that's a negative kindness. Anger could be used in a negative way. Most of the ways that we're thinking about anger, we're thinking about anger in its negative form. But there's another anger. Your child runs into the street. Are you going to be angry? Why are you going to be angry? Because you want your child to never do it again. And you're going to be very, very firm with your child so that they know this is a terrible thing. You don't run into the street. Was that a good anger? Perhaps it was to teach them a lesson. There are many, many more examples that we can give of good traits, positive traits. They can be used in a negative form and negative traits that could be used in a positive form. So God having anger for that sliver of moment, perhaps it's to execute the wicked people and to cast and to give the judgment on those who do wicked things. So it's not a negative trait of God. It's a perfection of God's trait. God is perfect in all his traits. In all of his traits. The Gemara now asks the Kamazamo, and how long does God's anger last for? Gemara says, Rega, a moment. The Kama Rega, what is that time of a moment? This is from a different Gemara that we're comparing the two. Omar Amemar, Amemar says, and some say it in the name of Ravina, Rega Kememre. You know how long a moment is? How long is a moment? As long as it takes to say the word Rega. Rega means moment. How long is Rega? How long, as long as it sounds Rega. That's it. That, that was the moment. Imagine, the only anger God has is how long? The moment of anger is as long as it takes to say the word moment. Is that a millisecond? That's how long God's anger is. The Gemara seeks the scriptural source for this. Now, just let's take a step back, because it's your first time in our Thinking Talmudist class, and I'll tell you why we do the Thinking Talmudist to begin with. So this could serve as an introduction to all of our Thinking Talmudist classes. I'm going to give you this little diagram here. Okay, this diagram is the reason why we do the Talmud class. Let me explain. You see, people ask all the time, why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? We have all these questions. We need to know that every single thing we have in Judaism is sourced not only in Halakha, not only in the Oral Torah, but in the Written Torah. The rabbi has an opinion on something, right? You know what you need to ask? What's your source? And if the rabbi can't give you a source in the written Torah, I'd question it. The Talmud here is giving us examples of things, giving us reasoning for things. The Gemara always says, what is your proof? I had someone sitting in this room just this week. After one of the classes, the individual says to me, you know, I used to be part of the church. And I left the church. I said, why did you leave the church? What, what's wrong? You're not, you know, non-Jew? Find a place to serve God? I'm not endorsing it. But why would you leave? He says, because I asked my pastor a question. That seemed to be a contradiction 
between what their faith says and what the Bible says. And the pastor said, Have you no faith? You're asking questions? Look in the Talmud here. The rabbi said something. We don't say, Have you no faith? But rather we say, What's the source? What's the source? And now the rabbi needs to bring a source. You can't just say something. You've got to give us a source. So anything that you find in the Rambam, in Halacha, anything you find in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law, needs to be sourced. And it's sourced in the conversations of the Talmud that source all of their conversation in the written Torah. So if you have something that's not sourced, question it. Question its authenticity. Question its veracity. And that's what this Talmud podcast is all about, is giving us the opportunity to see that the rabbis are not allowed, they're not authorized to make up anything. I know they sell it in many different it's called labels out there that are not totally observant. And they like to throw things, oh, the rabbis make up these rules. It's just midrash. It's just that. It's very sad how ignorant those statements are. Everything is sourced. I welcome any of those rabbis, reform, conservative, and otherwise, who doubt the authenticity or the veracity of the Torah. Come learn Talmud with us. Friday at noon, Central Time, here at the Torch Center, Come on with us. You will see that everything is sourced in the Torah. The rabbis have no authority to make up rules. Your ignorance doesn't make it just the rabbis made up rules. Everything needs to be sourced. So from where do we know this from? What's your proof? The Gemara asks. Dixiv, it stated, Ki rega be'apo chayim b'ritzono. In Psalms it says, For his anger endures for a moment. His favor extends for a lifetime. And if you prefer, say that the length of God's anger is derived from a different, a different verse. And that is, Hide for a moment until the anger passes. For behold, Hashem is going forth from his place to bring punishment. So that's another verse from scripture. The Gemara teaches the daily time of God's anger. What's that time? Amos Rasach. When is that time that God becomes angry? Amar Abaya. Abaya says, B'tlas shoi kamaisa. For a moment during the first three hours of the day. Ki chivoro kabalta, the Tanagola. When the comb of the rooster pales. When is that? At a certain moment during the first three hours of the day, a rooster's comb, the crest of his head, pales for, from its ordinary red color. At that moment is when God's anger occurs, and it's just, again, for how long is a moment? As long as it takes to say the word moment. That boom, boom, pass, done. Can't. Anger's gone. The Gemara asks, Kol shata v'shata mech v'archivra. He says, but we know that at all times the comb of the rooster can pale. So the Gemara says, Kol shata ispe Suraiki sumke. At all other times, there are red streaks in it. Some of the original red color is retained in the form of streaks. Hahishaito lespe suruke sumke. However, at that moment, at the first three hours of the day, the moment of God's anger, there are no red streaks through it. Okay, we're just going to finish off with the story here. The Talmud tells us a story, and the story is regarding a sage who was trying to use this indicator to figure out God's moment of anger. 
Rabbi Yehuda ben Levi have a mitzai le le hahu mino mikroi. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi used to be harassed by a certain heretic regarding scripture's proof that the latter would cite in an effort to prove his sectarian doctrine. Yom Achad, one day, Nakata Nagol of Ukme ben Kari Da'asa. One day, Rabbi Yeshua took a rooster and tied it between the feet of a bed. The Ayin Bay, and he started, and he steered at it intently. Sora ki matahahu hahishaita. He thought to himself, when that moment arrives, that the rooster's comb pales, I'll take, I'll curse this heretic for then my curse will be effective. And that way this heretic will be cursed and goodbye. I won't have to deal with him anymore. Kimotai hi shaito nimneng. When that moment came, Rabbi Yeshua dozed off. Omar Rabbi Yeshua thereupon said, Shma mino lav orach ar lamebad hachi. One may deduce from this, from the story that happened to Rabbi Yeshua Malevi, that it is not proper to try to calculate that moment. The Rachamov al Kol Masav Ksiv, because there's a verse to back up what the Shorban Lady says. And that is from Psalms that his mercies are upon all his creations. God's mercy is not only on those who do good, it's also on the heretics. The Ksiv, and it says as well, Gam Enosh Letzadik Lotov. And it is written, also, for the righteous, to punish is not good. More on the precise moment of God's anger, Tana Mishmei the Rabbi Meir, there was a b'risa that was taught in the name of a Meir, B'sha'a Shahamalochim, Menichim, Kisrein, Beroshein, and Mishtachem, and Lachama, when the pagan kings placed their crowns on their heads and bowed to the sun in worship, Miyad Kos HaKadosh Baruch that is the exact moment when the Holy One, blessed is He, becomes angry. That's the exact moment. And with that, my dear friends, we are going to conclude today's Thinking Talmudist episode. I think it's important for us to remember and to internalize this idea that Hashem is always there watching over us. He's always there protecting us Hashem wants our closeness, and sometimes Hashem needs to give us a patch. Hashem needs to give us a spanking to wake us up. Because sometimes the only potent messenger is pain. Pain is a wake-up call. We daven, we pray to God every day that we not need harsh wake-up calls. And my prayer, my blessing to each and every one of us, is that we get the message without the pain. As a people, as a nation, we should pick up on the messages. Hashem should bless us that we not need the painful wake-up calls. And we should learn and grow and connect without those harsh messages. Have an amazing Shabbos.